Hello, I'm Jared Younger. I'm director of the Neuroinflammation Pain and Fatigue Laboratory at UAB. And this is continuing our series of short videos where I talk about the new results that are coming out of the laboratory and the new projects we have running. And today I want to share some very preliminary but very new uh, set of results from some analyses I did a few days ago that I think are really important, especially to this question of are there ME-CFS or chronic fatigue syndrome subgroups? This question has been asked for decades. It's one of the most important questions in CFS. And it's basically, when you look at the millions of people with chronic fatigue syndrome, are all these people suffering from the same disorder? Do they have the same underlying pathology? Or is one group of them suffering from one problem and then a second group, maybe there's something completely different wrong and maybe there's a third group and there's something else completely wrong with them. And that's an important critical question because if that's the case, if there are subgroups of ME-CFS, that means we will need different treatments because there won't be one treatment that's going to help all those individuals. You'll need a treatment specifically for what is dysregulated in that individual. Now, this is something that's been researched, like I said, for a long time. Uh, if you're following the literature in ME-CFS, you'll see lots of attempts to, to define these subgroups. You may have seen that, uh, for example, some research has shown that early cases of ME-CFS may look different than later cases. You may have seen some subgroupings based on symptoms, whether there's inflammation, autonomic, neurocognitive, pain symptoms. You may have seen subgrouping based on whether or not participants meet um, case definition criteria for myalgic encephalomyelitis or not. Um, some recent stuff on classic versus atypical uh, immune dysregulation. So there's, there's lots of examples, lots of good work doing this. But I ran some analyses pretty recently that also strongly supports this idea of there being critical ME-CFS subgroups. And what I'm going to do is actually show you what I'm looking at when I first get new data and get new results from the blood. This is from the daily immune monitoring study. And some of you watching this video may have even participated in that study. It's where you do blood draws every day for 25 days and we track your symptoms. And then we track things in your blood to try to find an analyte that is predicting the symptoms. And then that becomes a new target. So I've talked about that project before, but now we have some brand new data using some brand new tests that I've never looked at before, and I think they're very informative. So I'm going to show you what I look at when I'm trying to explore these new data and uh, kind of walk you through what I'm finding and what I think it means and where I'm going to take this next. So let's go to the slides and uh, take a look at those. So here's some of the results I want to show you. Now this stuff, I haven't really edited it for presentations. This is pretty raw how I look at it. So pretty much ignore the axis labels and things. That's really more notes for myself than uh, for kind of public uh, presentation. But this is one individual out of about 25 that uh, we recently ran in the last cohort. And what you're looking at is 25 days of blood draws. And the blue line is their fatigue over that time. Now, unfortunately, you can't see how much fatigue they're in, but you can see whether it's high or low for this individual. So for example, when the blue is very high, such as in this red circle, that means their, their fatigue is higher during those days. So this is a week of about high fatigue. And then if you look kind of later around day 22, you can see that their fatigue is lower. So this is a person who started off with kind of a fatigue peak, but then over the 25 days, they had a slow decrease of fatigue and they ended up uh, lower, especially a few days before they ended, they had a particular few days where there was low fatigue. So this is interesting, but what's more interesting is when we look at the blood over those same 25 days, we see in this green line, uh, something in the blood that seems to track very closely with this person's fatigue. It started off high when fatigue was high and it kind of decreased over time. And you can look at several parts during this 25 days. It seems to go up and down almost exactly with the fatigue. So these two things seem to be tied together. So what is this green thing? Uh, this is called CRP or C-reactive protein. And this is an acute phase protein that's basically our early response to infections. So your CRP will go up very quickly if you have a viral or bacterial infection, maybe even a fungal infection. 
And so I think this is very interesting that it's tracking so well with this individual's fatigue. We can't know for sure what is happening here, but my guess would be that there is a low level viral or bacterial fungal, some kind of biologic infection, again, a very low level that is fluctuating. So maybe it's trying to replicate, maybe it's trying to emerge and the immune system is detecting that it's mounting a response. So the CRP rises and then that immune response is causing the fatigue because it's a natural part of an immune response as we feel tired. So this looks like the immune system trying to hit at some low level infection. What's important here is that these levels of CRP are actually quite low. In fact, the highest value for this person I think is about three nanograms per uh, milliliter, which if you went to a rheumatologist and you had a CRP test, that's not enough to make them concerned. So what's important here is even low fluctuations in MECFS patients may be important drivers of fatigue severity. So you wouldn't be able to detect this by just going in one time for a blood test. So this is happening in about one third of the participants that I've analyzed so far. And that's a significant number. That means, you know, 30 something percent, the CRP is, looks like it's going to be the best predictor of their fatigue. And I would say for this subgroup of individuals, they have this problem with an underlying infection that keeps trying to emerge and is engaging the immune system. But there are other subgroups. So I'm going to show you an example. This is another person from a second subgroup. And you can see in this person, they kind of started off with um, kind of high fatigue. Again, fatigue is the blue line. At around day 9, 10, 11, so the second week, their fatigue was lower than usual for them. And then toward the end, it got even higher. So at around the last week of the study, they had quite high fatigue in the blue line. For them, we look at the green line and we see for this individual, they also have something in the blood that seems to track very closely with their symptoms. It started off matching very well with fatigue. It dropped down at the same time their fatigue got better and it raised up or raised up slowly as their fatigue also increased. So what is this? For this person, the green line is something called fractalkine. And this is um, an analyte uh, that is too complex for me to go into right now. Uh, all I'll say about it right now is that it is elevated in a lot of autoimmune and chronic inflammatory disorders. Um, so we look at it in conditions where there is something dysregulated with the immune system, not having to do with an infection. So in this subgroup, the C-reactive protein didn't predict anything at all. So there didn't look like there, it didn't seem like there was an infection, but instead there looks like there is a dysregulation in the immune system itself. So I think this is a separate subgroup where the problem is completely different than this other subgroup. This subgroup here also uh, looks to be about a third of the total sample. And so about a third had this CRP response, about a third seems to have this fractal kind uh, relationship. Now that leaves another third, and I don't know what to call that group yet. I'm still analyzing it. It may be that there's a different set of immune markers that are predicting fatigue in that group, or it may be that that third group, their symptoms aren't driven by the immune system at all. It could be energy metabolism. It could be an endocrine dysregulation. It may be some other mechanism. I don't know that yet, but we're going to keep looking at that. So that's all I'm going to say about this for right now. Just to give you a glimpse, I really just started digging into all this data and we have to make sense of it. But um, we're definitely going to follow up on this and I hope this will help us develop some objective tests to distinguish one type of MECFS from another so we can do more targeted treatments. For this first group, the CRP, um, we need to start scanning uh, the system for viri bacteria and look for fluctuations in those day to day to see if they are increasing a little bit and driving these symptoms. I think that would be very important. So a lot of stuff to do. Um, we're running a new cohort um, right now, another large group. And so we'll see if this um, if these results replicate and I will keep people up to date. Again, I, I can only give a little sliver of information because we have to publish this scientifically. And if something's public domain, you can't publish it or it's very hard to. So I can give a little 
peaks here and there, but uh, we can't talk about the results fully until it's published in a scientific journal. So that'll all come, and I'll give you some little um, little, little peaks as they come up, and I'll be doing a lot of analysis over the summer, so there should be lots to talk about. But that's it for now. Uh, thank you for listening, and more coming soon.